Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, glad to see so many people that showed up here for this first, uh, this first event that we have in Southern Utah. I'm real excited about it. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about solving the people problems in your VMDR program, because believe it or not, the technology is not your issue. Um, so I wanna give just a little bit of background about me for those of you who don't know me. Uh, my name's Jesse Harris. I am a cybersecurity engineer at a company called Dental Intelligence. They make software for dentist offices, which is, you know, it doesn't sound super exciting, but I, I actually have a pretty good time there, and I work with some pretty fantastic people. Um, this uh, is a slightly older picture of me. Uh, it's about 1985. Uh, the older people in this room will probably recognize the Commodore 64. That was the first computer I used. Uh, we got our first family PC in 89. Uh, it was a glorious 286 from Packard Bell uh, before they were really terrible. Uh, and I got a hand-me-down from my grandfather about two years later. So I've been, I've been doing technology for a very long time. Uh, I got my uh, start in cybersecurity um, at Symantec back in 2011, uh, supporting PGP software. Moved to RSA, I was at RSA for eight years. Uh, did a couple years at Microfocus. Uh, you, I imagine here it's probably a little less, but many people in Utah have some nexus to Microfocus, Novell, or Attachmate. Uh, usually it's about half the room. Uh, just pretty funny. Um, I, my first cybersecurity incident was actually back in 1999. We busted a credit card fraud ring that was operating out of Phoenix. That was, that was really exciting. That's how I got my first taste of working on that kind of stuff. Uh, I do wear a lot of hats. Uh, mostly I've been working on vulnerability management this year. So it's something that we didn't really have in place and I had to make from scratch. And I thought it'd just be a good idea to share some of the stuff that I've learned here. Now, I do want to make, uh, make an observation here. This is something very insightful, insightful that was shared with me last week. All advice comes with a free side of survivorship bias. So I can tell you what's working for me, and that does not mean it will work for you. It might. It might not. So it's free. Take it for what that's worth. So I have had to recently implement a VMDR, VMDR program from scratch. And I don't mean just get some software, install it, call it a day. Um, the software is pretty easy. We had to build a lot of processes around it because the software will give you a lot of great information. Someone's still got to do something with it. There's no magic button that says, yes, patch, please. Uh, prior to this, patching was pretty sporadic. It was, it was not really on a scheduled cadence. Um, it was usually no more than pressing the Windows Update button, which, you know, that updates Windows, but there's a lot more to patching than just Windows out there. What really drove this is we had a push for PCI compliance. And any of you who've been through a PCI compliance process, you know exactly what that's like. Um, the easy part was actually picking the technology. Uh, I went out and just, you know, picked top three VMDR products. Uh, Tenable, Qualys, Rapid7, quickly eliminated Rapid7 because it didn't meet our needs, did a bake-off between the other two. That took a couple of weeks. That was, that was the easy bit. And then we had, you know, about another couple of weeks for implementation. So it was pretty, pretty easy to do that. The tricky part's acting on what we found. So there are a lot of things that your technology can and will solve. Technology is great at automating processes for doing things way faster than humans can. Um, works well for well-defined problems, problems that don't have a lot of fuzziness or need a lot of judgment calls. So if you think about what a vulnerability management process would look like if you were doing it manually, you would log into a computer, you'd go look at what software is installed, you'd check the patches, you do that on every single computer compiled in a lovely spreadsheet because in information security we love our spreadsheets. You would go see if there's patches for those products, you would read all the stuff. This sounds like a lot of work, doesn't it? But the technology is really great at going in, scanning the system, saying, here's what you've got, here are the patches that are available for it, here's links to all the notes to read. So that's taking care of a ton of the work right now. You're still obviously going to need to do some work at figuring out you know, the priority of patches, if there's patches that simply do not apply to you or ones that you've already mitigated for. Um, I, I've got to say that the, the status of, uh, of VMDR, program, VMDR software is pretty good. You, you get a really comprehensive view of what's going on out there. Um, you know, patching is even not really all that bad anymore either. We've got great technology to automate that because when you think about when you're installing a patch, what are you doing? You keep clicking next until you click finish. 
A computer can do that, right? And so we have a lot of great tools to automate that. There's platforms like Intune, Jamf, Manage Engine, Jump Cloud. There's dozens of them now. Um, it can even be as simple as a scheduled task of you have Windows automatically downloading and installing the updates for you. You can schedule apt on your Debian builds to automatically install for you, even do the scheduled updates. Uh, you know, this is, this is really great. It's not like the 90s anymore where you have to handhold everything. And these are all problems that are fixable by technology because they're predictable, they're repetitive tasks, and it's, and you could have a human do it, but it's way faster, cheaper to have a computer doing it. But there are a lot of problems in your VMDR program that your technology is not going to solve. And the problems are always your people. This is not what you, this is not going where you think it's going. So let's think about how this program is impacting your IT team. So I, I think it's I think we'd all agree that software's gotten a lot better than it used to be, right? Like 20 years ago, you wouldn't install patches because you're like, oh no, that's going to just wreck all my stuff. I'm going to lose data. It's, I'm going to be spending three days fixing it. And patches, they still sometimes go sideways, but they don't do it quite as much as they used to. But those of us who've been around for a while, and that's pretty much everyone over 40, you know who you are, um, we've seen the patches gone bad. We've seen, oh no, my operating system went down, my data is all corrupted, I've got to pull backups from tapes, this is going to be my entire weekend and probably most of Monday morning before people open the doors. And when you go to your IT teams, they always come up with a lot of what ifs. What if a patch fails to install and we can't get the application running again? What if it corrupts the data? What if we have to spend the whole weekend backing out our changes? What if we have to rebuild the boxes? What if the snapshots got corrupted? What if our backups are bad? What if, what if, what if? The what ifs come from a place where people have had these bad experiences. But part of the problem is that those of us who've had these bad experiences, we keep passing on these bad experiences to anyone new coming into the field. We set these expectations of patching is a nightmare and patching breaks things, even though it is better. We like to throw punches at Windows all the time and make fun of Microsoft, but when was the last time you had a Windows box just fall over dead and it wasn't hardware or a bad driver? It, it's been a long time. I, I can't think of the last time I've had that problem happen. You know, but we still end up, you know, talking trash about it. And, you know, we need, we need to have a different mindset there of what kind of impressions are we passing on to our colleagues and coworkers? What kind of mind share are we creating here that creates this barrier to patching? We, we shouldn't do that. And a lot of the reason why IT is in this scared of patches mindset is because they're getting blamed all the time when anything goes wrong. It's the joke. Everything's working. Why are we paying you? Wait a minute. Now everything's broken. Why are we paying you? You can't win. You don't get the credit, but you do get the blame. And so this is a problem within your, this is, if you have this mindset in your organization, it's something that has to be fixed. Like IT needs to be able to get the kudos for things working smoothly, not just all the blame for when things go wrong. This can, this can lead to some, this blame, it leads to long hours. It leads to weekends and evenings doing this work. It leads to burning your people out in a cynical work environment. It's not healthy. This is a people problem. Your technology will not solve this problem. And IT is not the only party that hates patching. Your users don't like it either. Got a challenge for you. Log into your MDM platform and see when the last time your users restarted their system was. It's been weeks or months. I can guarantee you that. Mac users, you're the worst. You won't reboot unless someone puts a gun to your head. I don't know what to do about that. But it's not like this is unfounded. Like when we think about it, again, going back to software quality, the system's still running even though it hasn't been rebooted in months. So the user's like, well, I don't, I don't need to. My, my system's working fine. Uh, wait, you're asking me to reboot? I got a Zoom meeting in three minutes. I can't reboot right now. You want me to reboot now? I, I'm leaving to go pick up my kid from a soccer game. I can't reboot right now. Your reboots are not happening because they're, the users are being asked to do it at a time that's inconvenient to them. There's no incentive for them. We'll, we'll get back to incentives in a minute. Dev teams 
are also resistant to patching. And the dev teams are resistant to patching for very good reasons. In this case, a lot of them have intense pressure for features, features, features. That's what the product team is usually pushing on them. Get more features, get more features. You can address the bugs later. We need features, features, features. I gotta sell to this other organization that wants the software to do this thing and they wanted it done yesterday. And they aren't really given the resources and time to go into that backlog. They are not given the resources. Now what's important to remember is that we are trying to fix problems. We're not trying to go and fix the people. The people are not, I say that the people are your problem, but I don't mean that in that you need to go, uh, you know, bust out your LART and go hit the users until they do what you want them to. That's, that's not how this will work. We can't go blaming them for getting in our way because we as security people, we are enablers. We are trying to make sure the technology is serving business needs, right? We want, that's the whole reason it's there. We're not given this playground of technology to make this perfect little Minecraft castle, are we? The technology actually has to do something. It has to generate revenue. And so we need to take the time to listen to these user concerns. Like users are telling us, even if they're not verbalizing it, what's wrong with our patching program. And we need to take the time to sit down and listen to them and say, give me your concerns. Let me know how this isn't working for you. Let's work together to find a solution. You would be amazed at how much more progress you will get if you just talk to people. And I know a lot of people go into technology thinking, well, you know, I, I just want to work with machines all day. I don't, I don't like people. I don't want to work with people. Well, you have to work with people. The machines are not, are not what you do all day. The machines help people do stuff. And you can fix machines easily. That's why we like working with machines. They, we can, we know, oh, this failed, I can fix that. But with people, it is a lot harder, that's a lot harder nut to crack. One of the things you really need to think about is you need to think in terms of incentives for a patching program and not punishments. We, um, we get in this mindset of we need to create disincentives. Um, if you haven't had a chance to watch it, you should jump on YouTube and look up uh, Sean Price's talk from St. Con about Shuhari. Yeah. He's, yes. Yeah, this, this is exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about here. So you've got to think, what incentivizes people to get this work done? And what, you've, what you may have noticed from you know, the, the things I've brought up from IT and dev is that they don't feel like they have the incentives from the top to do it. And so you really need to get that buy-in. What have you done to make senior leadership think this is important? Because if, as, as someone on uh, Mastodon put it very succinctly, they don't want us sitting there talking about bits and bytes. They want us talking about dollars and cents. What's the dollar value of patching? I know we hate to think that way because we think, oh, that's what the suits think. Well, you got to think suit. You got to talk suit if you want to get things done. If you are sitting there going blah, blah, blah about firewall rules and patching and CVEs, your C-suite's gonna glaze their eyes over and they're gonna be like, shut up, nerd. And so that's, that's a very important skill you should think about developing. Now, once, once a C-suite sees that a patching program is financially beneficial, you won't believe how quickly they buy into that. Right now, we have been in the process of doing a PCI project and we're looking forward to SOC 2 getting in compliance with GDPR and we have full buy-in. And you know why? Because we, are point, we have got customers saying, once you got SOC 2, we're signing six-figure annual contracts. Now, that, if, you're, if, you're, if you're the CFO, you're like, yeah, 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 do SOC 2. What do you need? Tell me, I'll, I'll cut the check today. And that's the, kind of, that's the kind of incentive you need to have there. You need to have that buy-in from the top because now they're saying, okay, I'm going to resource the IT team to get all this done. Oh, we need to do these things for the dev team? Okay, let's think about getting those resources for the dev team because that's going to align with the business. You might even get some you know, additional headcount by doing that, whereas previously people see that you're a cost center. And that's really what we need to do is we need to make sure that we are making our value case up there. So, Hopefully this will play through. 
Yes, just go ahead and play the. All right, it's gonna. I don't think I've got audio, so it's not gonna let me. Yeah, I've got it plugged in, but sound doesn't seem to be. Ah, uh, hold on. This thing is tricky today. Uh, well, that's probably not going to play. But, um, hold on. Anyway, you probably have all seen Office Space, right? And so it's this, this is the scene where Peter is sitting in with the Bobs, and he's talking about having eight different managers to report to. And they are just absolutely flummoxed at the idea that he's reporting to eight different managers. And he says, well, you know, really my only drive is to not get hassled, that or lose my job, but you know, that will only make someone work just hard enough to not get fired. And so we have to think about our motivations here. We need to think about what the incentives are for everyone to do it. And that's, like I said, that comes from the top. If we create the incentive of, you know, if we do this in our security program, then this is where it creates dollars for us. This is where we're reducing risk, you know. That's the kind of thing where the C-suite says, well, how can we make this happen for you? And these incentives matter. Incentives work a lot better than punishments do. There's, there have been so many psychological studies on this that positive incentives will get people to do things in ways that negative punishments will not. Absolutely will not. And it's important to understand that, that you need to have those incentives in place, and that has to come from the top. Once everyone sees that there's a benefit to the business, they will work with you and create those incentives. You know, those incentives for the IT team may be, hey, maybe we work on building a more robust infrastructure so that you can just patch any time during the day during your normal work hours rather than we have to wait for, you know, off hours in the evening or the weekend. That's a great incentive. For the dev teams, it's, hey, you know, we will give you the time to work on, these, on this backlog of stuff and maybe that makes it easier for you to develop the features so that you're spending less time doing your work. And that's really what it's about, is we need to make sure that we are enablers in the organization. Now this is going to be a really, this, I'm gonna say that VMDR is tough to do. Um, I, I haven't yet achieved everything I've talked about today. Uh, we've only been doing this for about four or five months. Um, and you know, people often teach things that they wish that they were doing. Uh, we, we like to present the idealized version of ourselves when we talk about this, and I know that I'm doing that here. But you do need to lay the foundation one piece at a time. And I think the IT team is always a good place to start because these are people of where you can talk the technology. They understand this is where the risk is and not patching. Here's what we need to do to get the patching done. And that is a good way to start laying that, that foundation. And you need to make sure that while you're doing this, you're documenting your work, you're documenting your results. Because you can take these results to other, to leadership and to other teams and say, hey, look at what we've accomplished. Let's do the same for you. And now we've got it to a point where in just four months, we've burned down thousands of vulnerabilities that Tenable is yelling at us about. We have got patching on a regular cadence now. We're using our maintenance window every Sunday to make sure stuff gets done. We're starting automation of where I click a button and just roll stuff out rather than having to wait. Uh, we, we have achieved a lot in that short time. And it's been fast because we've had that executive buy-in, and this is the most important part, because we have really good working relationships with each other. You've got to establish those working relationships because again, it's the people. People who don't like you won't do what you ask them to. That is a fundamental truth. Something that, uh, something that I've learned in politics, which applies in office politics too, is it's the art of getting people to like you so that they do what you want them to do. And I have had to be very intentional there and make sure that we are doing those small steps. Uh, I've started making some inroads with the development teams of you know introducing myself to them and talking about, you know, hey, what are our security goals? How do these align with what you want to do? You know, how can we, how can I help you? Don't go to somebody with a security issue and say, you need to do this. 
that is a way to make sure that somebody's going to be like, I'm not doing that now because you told me to. You need to go to them and say, how can I help? That mindset, that language changes the entire relationship. And we, I have had you know, great conversations with our dev and QA teams of they're excited about patching, which you know, that's usually people are like, oh, I'm, I'm terrified of patching. I, want, I think things will break. But they're seeing that we are trying to make sure that things work well, and we're trying to help them do their job and get stuff off their plates. Um, I will warn you that we're a small organization. We can, we've been able to move pretty fast. If you're in a larger organization, you're looking at multi-year projects. Don't let that get you discouraged. Think of every, break everything down into small steps and be like, you know what? If we are patching better this week than we did last week, we're moving forward and we'll get there eventually. It's a marathon and it's not a sprint. So make sure that you are pacing yourself appropriately. Thanks everyone for coming out here today. Really appreciate you. If you have any questions, comments, or rude noises, please let me know.